Closer, Scott. Yeah. Scott. Okay, we're going to improvise tonight, so I'm using someone else's mic. Uh, welcome to the Development Review Commission of June 12th. The Development Review Commission is created to hold public meetings and hearings to provide analysis and recommendations to the City Council regarding general land use policies and applications where the Commission has the power to recommend and to render final decisions on specified applications where the Commission has final decision making power, including but not limited to all aspects of a proposed and future development. The Development Review Commission recognizes that the creation of a desirable environment throughout the city for residents, business, and industry is a prime requisite for the interdependence of land values, aesthetics, and good site planning by promoting harmonious, safe, attractive, and compatible development that's therefore considered to be in the best interest of public health, safety, and general welfare. I'd like to start the evening by introducing the commission members. To my left is Andrew Johnson, Bill Amorosi, Scott Sumners. To my right is Vice Chair David Lyon, Mike Domenico, and Tom Brown. I'm Chair Linda Spears. Um, from staff, we have Cynthia Jarrett, Diana Kaminsky, Obimi Kingsley, and Suparna das Dasgupta. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the uh, meeting minutes from May 8th. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Been moved by Commissioner Di Domenico. Is there a second? Second. Been uh, moved by Commissioner Di Domenico, seconded by uh, Commissioner Amorosi. All those in favor? And that passes 5-0 uh, with uh, <laughs> the commissioners present. Um, at the meeting approving and one abstention by uh, Vice Chair Lyon. Uh, the next item is a uh, consent agenda and we're going to hear these items without uh, public testimony unless there's someone in the audience that would like to hear that. The first uh, uh, case is number three, Treble. Is there anyone from the audience wishing to discuss that. Um, the second is item four, which is the Heinz Mini Warehouse. Is anyone in the audience to speak on that? Seeing none, we'll um, vote on these on consent. Uh, we will take two separate motions to read into public record a condition for uh, item number four. Vice Chair Lyon. Madam Chair, I move that we approve on consent agenda the uh, treble project. There's a second. Moved by Vice Chair Lyons, seconded by Commissioner uh, Johnson. All those in favor? And that passes 7-0. Um, motion for item number four. Madam uh, Chair. Vice Chair Lyon. Uh, I move that we approve the mini storage project with condition that applicant work with city staff to resolve mechanical screening. Second. It's been moved by Vice Chair Lyons, seconded by Commissioner Di Domenico. All those in favor? And that passes 7-0. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Broadway apartment. <coughs> Good evening, Chair and Commission. I'm Diana Kaminsky, Senior Planner, City of Tempe Community Development Planning Division. The Broadway Apartments request includes a zoning uh, change from general industrial to R4 multifamily. Um, our general plan changed the land use designation for this with the adoption of General Plan 2040. So this change of land use um, in the zoning actually will be bringing it into conformance with General Plan 2040. So the request is for the zoning change as well as a use permit standard to allow an increase in building height from 40 feet to 44 feet. The industrial district allows up to 35 feet. Um, of course, that could also be done with a use permit standard to increase. Um, they are proposing a four-story apartment community at this location. It's about 17 acres. It's located on an old uh, tip-top nursery site. It's been used for 
construction materials um, equipment storage over the last mm -hmm. few years. It's been vacant. There are apartments to the east and southeast of it, um, as well as some condominiums further east. And then to the south, there's a strip of residential office. And then to the south of that is single family residential homes. They're complying with all of the R4 zoning development standards with the exception of the request for the increase in height. So that's the use permit that you see. The gray shaded one is the deviation from the standard. Their setbacks are actually significant lar significantly larger than what they would need to be. Along Broadway Road, there would be a 68-foot front setback. And along Country Club, they would have an 81-foot setback to the building itself. Site plan has a single building that's oriented north-south following the property line configuration with a drive that circulates around the building to serve for parking and fire access with refuse located at both ends of the project for convenience of the residents. Uh, most of the surface parking is covered uh, and they have a significant amount of landscaping that they're proposing around the perimeter of the property. They do have a pool amenity area that's in the front on the east side of the building near the main entrance. This is kind of an abbreviated version of their landscape plan showing the trees. They've got a perimeter buffer adjacent to the, the industrial uses to the north and west, as well as street trees located along Broadway and Country Club Road. Elevations are um, picking up off of some of the characteristics of the surrounding industrial area. It's kind of a contemporary building, a lot like some of the other multifamily projects we've seen. Um, staff worked with them to try to provide some more um, masonry. Um, there is one condition that was added for the street front, which is the south elevation, rather than just the little bit of masonry on the pop-out that you see there, to have the entire surround of that um, element facing Broadway be masonry. The applicant has agreed to the stipulations in the, in the report. There's some street front elevation. Perspective rendering from Country Club and Broadway. Another perspective looking to the northeast. And that's it. Um, the public meeting did have several residents in attendance. Um, their primary concerns were with the addition of traffic um, and the building height itself. Um, as well as a concern for the increase in density in the area. Staff is recommending approval of this based on the general plan compliance and what's being proposed is in conformance with that. So I'll entertain any questions and defer to the applicant for anything related to the design standards. Questions of staff? All right, if the applicant would like to uh, make a presentation. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, my name is Jack Gilmore, Gilmore Planning and Landscape Architecture. Um, staff review is very thorough, the report is very complete. Uh, since the time we started this, this plan has evolved with the materials and building, the design, the pop outs, and the landscape. And I think, uh, we'll, as Diana mentioned, we are fully conform or in agreement with the stipulations for approval. Um, during the neighborhood meeting, and I think I'd be glad to address any questions regarding the planning effort here, but I think since we're in full agreement with the staff recommendation, I want to address some of the concerns that we've heard to date. At the neighborhood meeting, uh, we had five residents appear, and I think the overall concern was the building height and potentially the density. And I'm going to address that directly. The, the site area is only 3.7 acres. Uh, and when we talked to the neighbors, we presented this as a kind of a unique project. And then before I go too much further, I want to let you know that the project architect is here, Mike, or Brian Anderson. So if there's questions about the building design, the elevation, the materials, Brian can also assist me. Um, relative to the density and the building height, as Dinah said, we're fully in conformance with the general plan. And I think because this is only three and a half, 3.7 acres, uh, maybe that's why the general plan allowed this higher density at this particular location. Uh, we are set back quite a bit from both Broadway and Country Club, and we have an extensive streetscape that I think will help to mitigate the views. 
Uh, one of the residents who I think will get up here and talk is uh, lives further south, Mr. Rivas. And he made a request that we save the eucalyptus trees in the southwest corner of the property. And we're going to make that effort. Those are eucalyptus microthecas. They're sure live, but I think with the proper maintenance, we could bring those things back to looking pretty good. Um, <clears throat> So I think the, the uh, overall concern expressed at that meeting was what the staff or what the residents did not want to see is what's happened along rural and Broadway. And that's where those apartment complexes are literally on the streets. Uh, in this case, we're set back quite a ways. So I, I think that's an important consideration. I think we're on the perimeter of the multifamily area. There is an extensive multifamily uh, concentration of units to the east of us that extends over to the 101. And we're on the west end of that concentration, right next to the industrial. So I think, in some regards, we see ourselves as a buffer, as a four-story complex to the extensive two stories to the east of us and south. Um, if there's questions, I'd like to address those. And I can have Brian come up and address any questions you might have about the architecture. Questions, uh, Commissioner Brown? I have a question for your architect. Uh, it's an easy one. Can you give your name and address for the record, please? Brian Anderson, 207 North Gilbert Road, Gilbert. The, um, don't laugh, the mechanical screen is nicely drawn. Um, and it says metal, but it doesn't say what it is. Is it galvanized, pre-finished metal, painted, uh, flat, ribs? The screen wall for the mechanical units will be a prefabricated, uh, pre-finished um, uh, product that we'll use on top of the roof. Yes, will the panels be flat or corrugated? It'll be corrugated to match some of the corrugating that we have on this the side of the building. Vertically corrugated? Yes. And you have some of that siding material already on the, you said you match some siding material you already have? That is in, correct, in yes. Design? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions uh, for the applicant? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and then we'll give you a chance to come up and, and speak Thank again. You. Um, so I'd like to ask um, Ann Till. And if you would just watch the uh, uh, lights here on the whole box, and when, they, okay. when it turns red, I'm going to tell you to wrap it up. Okay. And okay, so my name's Ann Till at 1935 East Meadow Drive, and I've been in my home 22 years. I'm the Alameda Meadows Neighborhood Association Chairman, and LATE &E is the on Huntington, and she's the uh, McClintock Neighborhood Association Chairman. And this is Johnny Narden from the Shalimar area. And um, so we are, want to talk about the Broadway apartments, obviously. And we oppose the R4 zoning. It's very out of character for our area. And neighboring apartments are three, and they're only 30 to 33 feet tall. This proposed building is 44 feet tall, so it will tower above the nearby areas. The proposed is four story, the nearby are two-story and neighborhood, neighboring Willowing, Willow Creek is about 10 foot further back and it's only two stories than this one. Um, the Alameda character area plan calls for transitions or step ups from lower building heights to higher so in the proposed units don't provide, provide that transition. The proposed units will have 90 units, more than half are one bedroom geared toward young professionals and college students. The developer states that the rates will be higher the nearby apartments. Alameda needs more family-oriented housing, especially affordable, and this is not either of those. And um, the, the higher rate structure, I'm worried, will result in nearby rates increasing at the other apartments. The urban core and ASU Novus areas already have an abundance of these being built, and they are already covered. So this is, need is already covered by that. Um, the exterior is mostly adobe with some stuff I guess they've added, but it says that our character area plan says that construction materials throughout the Alameda area must be honest in nature, exposing their raw characteristics with limiting building materials with add-on surface treatments such as adobe. Note that this area is not an urban core area and should not be treated like one. Alameda needs to maintain their own unique character and the height density and design are very inconsistent with what is currently up and down Broadway, especially 
between Price and McClintock. And the building apartments is planned set a high density tall building precedent for future buildings in this area, which opens the floodgates for more of the same, which would result in future traffic issues and further ruining the Alameda neighborhood character area. There are other options that would be R3 zone for that would be more consistent with their character, given that everything around it's R3. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, did anyone else want to say anything or? No. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a question for you. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a commissioner, uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Um, it looks. I'm looking at the site plan, attachment 13, which I know you don't have. That yeah. it's a aerial photograph, and it looks like there's two driveways off this property, this proposed property, onto uh, Country Club Way. Oh yeah. But it appears that that's a cul-de-sac dead end, yes. and I can't quite tell from the photograph. Are there any uh, driveways to the Willow Creek Apartments off that road? Yeah, there's some from Willow Creek. I'm pretty sure there's one um, right when you turn right. You know. Okay, I. I, I there, can't tell there's from. a street in between. But I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I've driven by there several times, but I didn't really notice. I mean, at the end of the cul-de-sac, yeah, there's an entry there. And I think there's one that's just in a little bit, but I can't tell on the um, on this map offhand. I can't tell either, but maybe the, maybe the applicant can answer yeah. that question. I mean, the Willow Creek has a lot more open space. It is a bigger area, but, you know. I'm just trying to see what immediate impact on the traffic, for example, these 90... Uh, yeah, well, the, the impacts on Broadway, you know, and they have 175 parking spaces, so so the impact, there we already wanted a traffic light. The neighborhood's been asking for a traffic light there for years, so I, I think that the city's putting one there already, but at least one of the traffic guys told me that, but I'm not sure because I haven't seen it, but... But I'm also worried, you know, up the street, they've added a lot of apartments um, on the other side of McClintock, and that's just wall-to-wall -wall traffic up there, you okay, know. So, so related to my question, it appears that the surrounding buildings are all industrial? or I'm Yeah, they are industrial, and, okay. and I'm worried about, we're worried about that going from in, industrial to residential with all these tall buildings like on Apache, you know. We're not the urban core, we're in, and we need actually family units that are affordable, you know, not, not these one bedroom, um, the one bedroom ones are really kind of oriented toward college students and, and having them be so tall, not really seniors, you know, and there's over half of them are, you know, one bedroom. So it doesn't really support adding families. There's schools nearby that would really be beneficial to families. Plus it costs more than they're saying, that the developers told us that it would cost more. I understand. Yeah. Maybe we can ask these questions of the developer and thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, the next individual I have is Lon Griffiths. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the Design Development Review Commission, my name is Lon Griffiths. I've lived for 34 years uh, at 1952 East El Parque Drive, and it was on, my house was on the map there, stone throw from the proposed apartment complex. And I, depending on what the setback will be, I'll probably be looking at that project for a long time. I take it upon myself to do a lot of things right around that area. I'm for a long time city of Tempe's adopt a park volunteer for Solo Park. I my biggest concern as the corner of, of Country Drug Club and Broadway, I literally take upon myself to take a, a sickle and cut branches off palm trees along Broadway Road looking west because of the, tr the uh, treacherous area there. I, my biggest concern is that we've got a, have apartments on the northeast corner, on the southeast corner, and now this will be on the northwest corner, and, and we are without a light. There's tremendous traffic on Conley and Curry's school, whenever the school's in session, coming and going, trying to make that left turn off of college, uh, not country club, I'm saying country club onto Broadway is, is really a major thing. So my biggest concern is that we do need, I, am, I object to the project that we cannot get a traffic light at that corner given how much traffic there is, the people trying to turn left or turn right depending on where they're coming from. 
and that's that's my proposal. I think it's a beautiful project all in all. I'm curious to see how far back I'll set if they'll be looking in my backyard from that area, but uh, I think it's a good, clean project otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to speak on this project? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and allow the applicant to come if you want to address some of the issues that have been raised. Madam Chair, I wanted to address the, just the market that uh, we're using as a justification for this project. There was some research done, and there was deliberate effort not to compete with the neighbors. Those are two-story um, traditional flat apartments with all the exterior loaded. Uh, Willow Creek is on approximately 18 acres. There's 400 units. Uh, this is on three and a half acres, or 90 units, four, four stories tall. All these units will be accessible from interior corridors. Uh, all the floor plans are approximately 50% larger than all of our neighbors, so the rate structure will indeed be higher. And that was part of the intent of the developer was to not compete with the neighbors, but to offer a product that's maybe a step above. And the research tells them the floor plates need to be a little bit bigger, and the quality needs to be more modern, and the ceiling's higher. That was part of our justification and request for the use permit to allow the increase in height. Um, <coughs> regarding the traffic, we did do a traffic study. And our traffic engineer, Lee Engineering, did discover that the project at this location does meet warrants for a signal. However, that signal warrant was created long before our project showed up. That's the current condition. Our project delivers access or traffic from the north off Country Club Bay. You're right, there's two driveways that we have there are two existing driveways towards the top of the cul-de-sac, one going due north and one going almost due east from the cul-de-sac. And then they have another access point at the southeast corner of their project, about 170 feet west of South Rural Drive. Um, <clears throat> so when staff came back and requested that we participate in signal, we had no problem with that. I think the question is, when does that signal get triggered? And that will be part of our discussion, final design effort with the transportation um, and engineering staff. So that has yet to occur, but as Diana said, we're on board to participate with that signal. We did communicate with the schools, and we asked if they had any concerns about this project or the traffic generation or the students who might be trying to cross Country Club Way. They made it clear both John Curry and uh, Connolly School uh, said that they don't perceive any current conflicts with students crossing at Country Club Way. John Curry buses all of their students, so that's off the table. Connolly has 20 students coming from the north side of um, Broadway, but as I mentioned before, the extended area of multifamily starts at our project Country Club Way and goes east all the way to 101. The 20 students they're referring to are coming from that northeast area of our project, due east. And they all, for the most part, cross as South Rural because there is a signal there. So if the predominant traffic flow goes to that intersection, the students go south because that's where the main entry to county school is closer to that alignment. So to say that no students will use Country Club Way, I'm not going to say that, but I think the predominant uh, movement of students is to South Rural because there is a signal. Um, I have a question for staff because there is a signal at River. It's not rural, it's River. I'm sorry. Um, and we, we have requirements about how close stoplights are. And so we have the light, there's a light at rural. If the light went in at Country Club, that's not even a quarter. I mean, it's like an eighth of a mile, maybe. Is that reasonable? Well, I'm going to defer to traffic engineering. Srini and Julian have been working on this. Um, there was a study done to determine whether it was warranted. Um, I don't know the timing, but there is discussion about having a light put in at Country Club. Okay, um, are other questions for the applicant at this time? Okay. Seeing none, we'll close the uh, hearing then. And um, comments from commissioners? Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I wanted to address some of the uh, things. I, I definitely agree with uh, 
Mr. Griffiths, that there should be a signalized light on there. Uh, I know the one at River just gets triggered when there's cars that need to cross. Otherwise, it's Broadway stays green. Uh, so I'd like to see a light there, and that would help slow down traffic along that, that route, make it safer. Uh, I also agree uh, with Ann about the, uh, the bike pedestrian pathway, uh, the Country Club Way. I've always been a proponent of that, going to Apache Boulevard. And it looks like this developer left enough room there at the cul-de-sac to continue that. I see the problem with the property behind that being right up against that, that pathway. But that'll, that's a separate issue. Uh, I live on Apache, so I see the uh, taller apartments there between five and seven stories. And if this project was on the south side, I would definitely object to the height. But being on the north side and being set back, I don't think the neighborhood's going to see that, that height or feel that height. Uh, so I will be supporting this project. Thank you. <clears throat> Other comments? Anyone? Poster Lyon. I think it's a good project and I will be supporting it. Other comments? Um, I do not support the project. Um, I do believe it's too tall compared to the two-story units around. I am concerned hearing it's going to be a higher price product because that's not a higher price neighborhood. Um, and I don't believe build it and they will come. My biggest objection, though, is the um, changing the zoning from GID. And I realize the general plan um, is looking at this, but I think there's a real danger when we continue uh, to rezone properties from GID to um, R4, or MU, whatever, uh, because all these people that are supposedly moving to Tempe need to work someplace. And so um, I have a real concern about that. So um, for what it's worth, um, if no one has other comments, I'll entertain a motion. Vice Chair Lyon. Madam Chair, I move that we approve PL180095 Broadway Apartments. Okay. For a second. Um, it's been moved by Vice Chair Lyon and seconded by Commissioner Johnson. All those in favor and opposed? And that passes 6-1 with the chair in dissent. <clears throat> Our next item is uh, Tempe Crossroads. Good evening, Commissioners. The request for Tempe Crossroads includes a general plan amendment, a zoning map amendment, a planned area development uh, overlay, and a development plan review. They're proposing a mixed use development on the corners of Terrace and Orange Streets. It's a combination of about 10 lots that have a garden style apartments currently, and they would be proposing a new development along what you see here in the, in the map. This is an interesting area because the general plan called it out for residential, but put it in the classification of the highest density category, which is up to or greater than 65 dwelling units per acre. Um, the challenge is we don't have a zoning classification in the R category, the res multifamily residential category that would allow somebody to rezone in conformance with the general plan. So what they're proposing to do is to amend the general plan to mixed use the land use portion of the general plan in order to fulfill the density category within the general plan. Along with that, they are requesting a planned area development that would include the building height and the density um, and the setbacks for the project. Here's the site plan. Um, it currently uses an existing 10-foot alley that circulates around the north and east side of the property. Um, with that alley, we have an existing four-foot easement on the south side of the alley, and we've been asking for an additional six-foot easement to make the full 20-foot uh, alley configuration that we have that provides fire circulation around the site. In order to do that and provide traffic engineering's requirements along terrace, it involves reconfiguration of the terrace road 
driveway that they both they're sharing with the adjacent property owner and in order to make that configuration meet current uh, traffic engineering standards it encroaches to the north on the property to the north they did receive owner authorization from the property to north just today in order to allow them to develop as um, they've proposed but we did have some conditions of approval that we're going to address the, the, the timeline and the gap of when they might or might not receive that notification from the north property owner these are some uh, of the elevations of the building and the combinations of materials and colors that's being proposed. I'll defer to the applicant on their design intent. It does have a structured parking garage that's wrapped on the south side facing Orange Street with units that have mixed use. Um, they have a live work concept with a walk up unit for about six of the units along Orange. The predominant commercial frontage is their limited uh, street frontage on terrace and wrapping the corner with some, red, with some restaurant uses and then student housing above that. The north side is what you see here with the garage that's exposed here. They have a very diverse uh, landscape palette and they've provided most of the landscaping inside courtyards that serve the residents here and here. And then they have provided a separated walkway with shade trees on the south side of the sidewalk. So the sidewalk along Orange and along Terrace have been provided with a significant amount of shade and an enhancement from what we have today. They are retaining the existing on-street parking along Orange, providing some points of um, access through where the vehicles would be parked, and then providing some parking up here where the commercial uses would be closer to the corner. And here's some renderings showing the project. With the exception of the one email that I provided you in study session, staff has not received any other uh, calls or comments of inquiry or concern, and we're recommending approval of the project, and the applicant is in support of the stipulations in the report. Questions of staff? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Um, I was just curious. I saw the, the um, rendering of the <clears throat> would be the west side of the building or maybe the north side of the building where the parking garage is and there's a lot of times we'll see um actually it was back one right there so um, a lot of times we'll see a lot of screening and enhancements on parking garages but there's nothing here and i was wondering if you could talk through why that might be on this project well um we really focused on what would be visible along the street front the, the site is fairly narrow so looking at if I can go back what you're seeing in the exposed portion of the garage is here so your vantage point on terrace would be looking at this area in here and then looking down this the alley um, to that face here on the north side so the, the garage is fully screened on, on these sides so we didn't really focus on that north side. It's meeting the requirements for the street frontage and looking at that north side as, as kind of the back of house. They are, they are doing a, a ventilated garage in that location, so they didn't want to have it fully screened. Um, we didn't think it was visible enough to the street. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Vice Chair Lyon. Uh, yes, Ms. Kaminsky. Um, could you walk me through the parking requirement? I see here that... Um, the um, transportation overlay uh, for the ZDC would require 748, and what they're proposing is 473. Um, and can you talk me through that a little bit and the rationale that we would accept that? We looked at their parking study. Um, we've also gotten some direction that we want to reduce the amount of parking in this area or the, reduce the number of cars for traffic in this area. Um, knowing that it is a student project and its proximity to the university. Um, so through their parking study and looking at what's happened on other projects in the area, staff felt comfortable with the analysis that they did and did not recommend changes to that. Okay, and this is actually something that I wanted to be able to talk about a little bit as commission is, is that direction. Um, can you shed a little more light on what direction we've been given regarding that? Are, are there specific guidelines that we now have? We, we don't have reduce? guidelines for that. Um, we take a look at each project in the location that it is, in the context, 
and then we, we get the professional analysis from the applicant, and then we, we look at that and, and determine whether it looks like it works for that particular site. It, it is a council initiative. Have they given us any kind of clear direction, though? Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other, other comments, questions? Uh, if not, the applicant. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, my name is Nick Woodham with the law firm of Snell and Wilmer. My address is 1 Arizona Center, and I represent Collegiate um, <clears throat> Development Group. Uh, Collegiate is a, a national student housing company. Uh, they've been in the business quite some time, and, and uh, uh, they see this as a, a very attractive site and a very attractive location. Um, the area that we're looking at generally, this is the area that if there's been some direction, it's you know, the council's uh, policy that if there's going to be stu private student housing projects, they really need to be concentrated in an area that is right next to the, to the university, which is, of course, uh, universities on this side of rural. And they really identified this area in here as the appropriate location. And as such, you've seen a number of student housing projects, um, you know, basically be developed in this area. For example, here's Apache. Just south of here is the district. And now, Madam Chair and Commissioner Di Domenico, you were on the commission back in 2011 when I brought that project forward. Um, speaking of, of parking, Commissioner Ryan, you, you, you answered that question. Because it was so early in the, in the process and design of these things, um, that client decided to build one parking space per bed. And that's a 90-foot tall project. It has 900 beds, and there are 900 parking spaces in that parking garage. Three, three sides of which are wrapped, and one side is open toward what used to be the Sheraton uh, Hotel, is now the Moxie. Um, so there were some questions asked, and that is, really, 900 spaces for this project? Is there going to be that much demand? And nobody really knew the answer to that question. So they went ahead out of an abundance of caution and built 900 spaces. Well, today, and since it was built and open, um, it is more than half empty. Uh, there's, you know, the Bears Den is, is actually right next to it over here. Um, the Bears Den patrons can use that. They've actually begun to, to lease spaces commercially to the Moxie and to other places because, again, it's, it's been vacant. Now, since that time, um, uh, I did the project across the street, which is the Rise. Uh, the Rise is parked at a little less than one-half space per, um, per bed. It's about 0.48 spaces per bed. It's been open now for a year. It's 15 stories and 860-some beds. Um, they have more than adequate parking available. Now, all of these projects, of course, the parking isn't free for the residents. You know, each one of their residents has to pay for the parking, and it's not cheap. Um, but because we are on light rail, because of the advent of the streetcar, um, the demand for parking in student housing, particularly in this particular geographic area, is really pretty small. But again, the rise is a perfect example that they're parked at less than half of space per, per bed, and they still haven't filled up. And, and uh, when they opened in uh, this past fall, they were full 100%, plus they had a waiting list. Uh, we also did, I was also before you uh, just last month with the Gilbane project. That's right here uh, along Apache. And again, we parked that at, at 50.5 uh, or, or half a bed per, um, uh, half parking space per bed. Um, so again, that's, that's really the, the, the number of parking spaces that's been working. Um, has been working for the other projects as well. Uh, with respect to this project, um, there we go. As you can see, in fact, I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, it's a very strange uh, configuration. It's very long. It's very linear. It actually represents 10 different uh, legally defined parcels. And as the apartments were built on this, they were built in pieces you know, over the years. So it, it's an older uh, project than, um, you know, Orange is his front yard. Along the north side is an alleyway. And when I show you the site plan, you'll see the alleyway. One of the things that was important for us to do is right here, this entryway, um, that geography right here, or, um, or geometry, I should say, is a very dangerous access point. It actually comes into Terrace at a 45 degree angle. So one of the things that we'll do as part of this plan, which is why it's so important for us to get the approval of our northern neighbor to do this, is we're going to fix the geometry of that so it's a 90-degree 
angle. So when, especially emergency vehicles as well as cars go in and out, uh, it's a much safer configuration. But as I mentioned, you know, there's no single family residences around us. Uh, across the street is a vertex. The vertex is 90 feet tall, that's seven stories. We're gonna be, we're asking for 89 in the front and, and then down to five stories behind it. Uh, and of course, here's the Sterling. The Sterling is six stories, uh, that's, that's just north of us. Um, here's just a street view. You can see the vertex, the seven stories across the street. You can see the Sterling in the back, and it's Sterling is six stories. Um, this is the, the street uh, view along um, um, Terrace. And again, here's another shot of, of the project. You can see the, the Sterling that's back here, and this is along Orange. Uh, the general plan amendment, um, as you heard Diana say, you know, the general plan calls for greater than 65 dwelling units per acre, but there's no vehicle in the ordinance to do that. So all of these projects have been um, MU4s with a PAD overlay in order to allow us to accomplish the, the, the uh, density that uh, is, is suggested by the general plan. Um, but what's interesting is each one of these projects that we've done has to have the mixed use component. It has to have the retail. When we did the district, the, all the retail along the, the ground floor sat empty for the longest time because it just wasn't a critical mass of people living in the area. Well, now that more and more of these projects are coming online, there's more and more people that are able to patronize the, the commercial. So we find that it's, it's, it, it works really well, which is why for ours, for this project, uh, we're going to put a large restaurant right here out in front with outdoor dining because we think the restaurant's right here and this is outdoor dining, uh, because we think that there's more than adequate demand now for you know, a nice restaurant in this area. Again, it's on light rail, but it's a good position. The other thing is, we're adding this you know, live-work component. It's kind of a new concept for these types of projects. There's no other projects that have live-work, but it's a two-story element with, uh, you know, the, with the, uh, the work element being on the first floor, and then the living units above that, and we've got six of those along here. It does several things. It gives direct access onto the street, which of course activates the street. Um, but it, it, it creates this other commercial element and another option for people who live in this area. As you can see, as Diana showed you, this is the parking structure here. Uh, there's a development on all three sides. This is the seven-story element. Uh, the amenities are on top of the, uh, the garage uh, itself. And then we step down the five stories as we move away from that area um, you know, to the east. Um, and here's just another shot of that. Again, you can see that with the parking garages, with the amenities, um, the seven-story element going down to five and in the surrounding context. And again, lots of landscaping and things along the side. One of the challenges that you have when you have a long linear site is you don't want your building to be one large, you know, face, right? One flat face. We did the same thing when we took a look last month at the... Uh, uh, Gilbane project at 1100 Apache because again it's a long and linear uh, project so we had to kind of break that up. We actually did even I think a better job of breaking it up than what we did with Gilbane and 1100 Apache and we did a good job on that one. So this is the perspective. This would be the restaurant area right here. This is the corner that you would see um, all glass and things along terrace and then as you move away you can see the heavy landscaping uh, as well as you know the different elements. And I'll show you a little better picture of how the shifts, but to give you some example of some of the, the, um, the depth to this, uh, these, the windows are all set back eight inches from the, the facade. These little strips here, um, these are actually uh, six feet deep. So again, we're trying to, to break up the facade and give some, some depth and some three dimensions to it. Uh, this would be the, uh, the uh, restaurant corner right here. Uh, and that's actually, we expect there to be a little bit of uh, outdoor area where people, people can pick up food, etc. cetera. Um, here is the live work. Now, the live work has uh, a breakup right here on the wall, and the entrance in and out of the lower level is here and here. Uh, so basically, you have a live work here with entry here, entry here for the live work here, and the same thing with each one of these. Again, breaking up the facade and making it more pedestrian scale. Um, here's an example of how we've broken up the facades along uh, Orange. This is the, the this portion of the property that's nearest to Orange, or the structure. 
And here's where the um, restaurant is and that corner that I showed you. And this is the next element behind it. So we go from this design to this design, and then as we step down the five story, this design, this design, and this design. So we've created really five different shifts in the design so that as you stand or walk down orange, you're not looking at one long, boring building. Uh, we've also added uh, what's called illuminated panels, which I have no idea what they are. Um, we actually had to look, look them up. But it's, it's uh, brightly colored panels that, that bring a reflective and, um, uh, and it just, again, add color uh, and texture uh, to the architecture. Um, here is the, the north side, and I think um, there, was, there was a question, uh, Commissioner Johnson, about the, the parking garage. Although when you look at the two-dimensional element, you, know, you, you see it there, and again, we're not trying to hide it. Uh, but if, you, if you're a long terrace, it's set back far enough, and there's a three-story building that's basically right next to it. Um, so that covers it as well, and then the sterling is, is there as you're coming down. Um, we're happy to work with staff on some kind of screening, uh, if that's your wish, and if you want a stipulation that requires us to work with staff on that. But in working with staff so far, we're all pretty comfortable. No one's even going to notice it. Um, but, but that's how this ended up being this way. And like I said, the, the district is a perfect example of having three sides covered but one side open, and, and no one has noticed, noticed that. And here's the example of the work of the uh, live work. This is the first floor um, unit. Uh, again, the entry is out here to this porch area, which is this area right here. Living area is above it. And then we have the same thing on that side. Um, we've got, a, and I won't bore you with them, but we have a myriad of different uh, floor plans. And the reason is, of course, is because as you look at the geometry of the building, um, it's, it's, although it's a long linear site, it's not a straight long linear site. It, uh, it has lots of curvatures and, and breaks in it. So as a result, our architect had to be very creative in putting together floor plans, et cetera. Um, so with that, um, uh, we are very satisfied with the stipulations that have been proposed by staff. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions of the applicant? Commissioner Brown. Um, I'm a little concerned about the quality of light for the residents. Um, these two courtyards, for example, in the north end are, are taller than they are wide, and some have more than 30 uh, dwelling units. So we have 30, 34 units across the narrow space, uh, six, seven stories, five stories. Um, it just seems to me that there's a tremendous chance that there's going to be some noise and some issues there that are kind of difficult to live with. And of course, that's a small percentage of the total units. So the units that are face the uh, streets and the alleys are Tight to the right to the setback, and some of them are only are less than nine feet wide. The, the rooms, so I wonder how you how you can comment on the livability of a bedroom that's less than nine feet wide. Sure, um, Madam Chair, with your permission, I'd like to ask the architect and my client to come up because I think that's really uh, answer a question that, that they can answer. Uh, but I will add that this entire uh, area up here is all amenity space. Um, although we do we do have some courtyards here. Uh, we have the same courtyards in some of the other projects that we've done, and but we find that most of the activity occurs here on the rooftop, just like at the, at the rise, for example. You know, everything happens on the rooftop, and um, and in with the district, the district had what basically is 90 feet tall, and down in the very middle of it, at the very bottom, is all of the amenity space. So it's surrounded in a canyon by it. And again, that has not been a problem, but I, I think it's, it's it's a very good question. I'm Robert Booth. I'm the lead designer for Hensley, Ramclin, and Rachel Architects. Um, my address is 6360 Main Street, Houston, Texas. Um, I think to address the, the courtyard's question, what we've actually found is that the pool is really the location of noise in these projects. And so a, a lot of our early discussion was about where we were going to site this, given the narrowness of the, of the, the site. Um, and so the kind of decision came up to move that to the roof deck because we understood that was going to be probably the most active space. And what we found in when we have two courtyards in a project is the secondary courtyard is, is very quiet, despite um, no matter what the size of it is. So I actually think that despite them being narrow, and they are a bit narrow, I don't think noise is going to be an issue in this. Um, 
we've looked at light uh, studies down. Uh, they are narrow at five stories. We're getting a good quality of light down several stories. They will be a little darker at the bottom. Um, but we've also found that uh, even in situations where we have uh, multifamily often has corner units that are a little deeper, the bedrooms get pulled back off the courtyard. Those often rent just as fast as any of our other units. And what we're, what we're thinking and assuming is that um, we just have a variety of people that want to rent here. And so while there's enough units here that are you know, on the street are going to have a ton of light, there are some units that are darker and we assume that some people will be desiring of that kind of, of space. Um, the, the bedrooms are, uh, you know, designed essentially to provide them with the space they need to sleep, to study, and then we try to basically produce enough amenity space both in the living rooms of these, of these uh, units where they can get together with their roommates, but also in the amenity space of the project um, to study collaboratively to form a community in these spaces. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not about um, having a group of people over and spending time in your bedroom. The bedrooms are too small for that. The goal is to provide amenity spaces to allow that kind of socialization. Other questions? Other questions of the applicant? If not, we'll open the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone in the audience? I don't have any cards. Is there anyone in the audience to speak on this? Um, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Is there anything you want to wrap up with? Okay, we'll close the hearing. Um, comments from commissioners? Commissioner Johnson. Sure, I'll, I'll go back to this uh, parking garage thing. I, I, I won't have a big, I'm not, it's not a big sticking point for me, but um, it just came to mind because uh, we, we talked about another project that um, was down the road quite a bit, um, and they had an exposed parking garage very similar to this. Um, but it faced the um, the back side of a movie theater, and we talked through it, and, and um, the decision was that oh, that's it's not a big deal; it's not going to be visually stunting to the environment. Um, but this one, I think, facing the the development directly behind it, with people's doors probably facing that, and whatever um, may come in the future in the place of that um, specific development, um, it. it I wouldn't want to walk out my door and look at that every single day um, in general. So um, I don't, I don't. It wouldn't be a sticking point for me. But if the the rest of the commissioners are um, amenable, I would I would like to add a stipulation to um, have them work with staff to um, add some type of a an element, a screening element to the parking garage. Other comments, uh, Commissioner Summers. Um, let's see. I I, uh, I don't have an issue with uh, with the height here. Uh, it's matching what's across the street. Uh, if you go up the way a little bit, it's 75 feet, as opposed to 90. And if you go a little farther north, it's more than 200. So um, not much of a concern for height for me. Parking, I think, is an economic issue, and it'll solve itself. And especially given the location, right next to light rail, right adjacent to streetcar, um, I think it's a it's a great opportunity. I think we're hearing again and again in, in these cases that uh, the neighborhoods are concerned with height. And there's only so much you can pack in a building. And I'd rather forego the parking and go for more units. So this is exactly the kind of thing um, that I'd like to support. That What I really focused on here is the street presence on Orange. Because every morning and every night, there's about 800 people who are going to come out of this building and basically go west and go over to ESU. And so what I see is, uh, separating the street, there's a parking lane, there's a landscape swath of about six feet, and then there's an eight-foot sidewalk. And those are all three exactly the kind of thing that really makes something walkable. And it gets to the point to where it's like, those kids are going to ride the bike on the sidewalk, and I know Tempe PD doesn't like that. So <laughs> at some point, uh, we're almost making it too good. So I'm happy to support the project. Uh, Vice Chair Lyon. Uh, you know, I, I also think it's a fine project. Um, my one concern is, uh, you know, with parking, I know that um, we're, we're saying that um, this is council direction that we are going to allow for less parking at student housing projects. Um, I just feel a little uncomfortable with not having a clear direction other than uh, the applicant telling us this is what works. Um, so. You know, I'm happy to support the project, but I will state again that um, if we can get something that's a little more clear as far as direction as, as what sort of numbers we need to expect at these projects, I, I would find that very helpful. 
um, is I'm very concerned that we keep seeing projects, you know, loosely around ASU that say, well, we don't need the parking. And I don't want to get us into a, a habit of saying, well, that's fine. You tell us you don't need the parking and we'll say that's okay. Because uh, once that ship sails, then, you know, we've got an issue. Other than that, um, I'm very happy to support the project. Other comments? Commissioner Brown. I uh, can appreciate the density and the location. It's, uh, as a piece of architecture, it has some nice moves to it. I just think it goes over a line in terms of density and quality of life. And I think we have to, at some point, say too much. And so I do not support the project. Other comments? Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to be on record that I uh, support Commissioner Johnson's idea of putting some screening on the parking garage, because besides the Sterling, uh, the City Council also approved another 25-story building on the corner there. So uh, that parking garage will be visible to a lot of people to the west. Anyone else? Um, I'll entertain a motion. Commissioner Johnson. I move for the approval of Tempe Crossroads PL180082 with the added stipulation that um, the developer work with staff to add some type of screen to that uh, parking garage. Um, seconded. It's been moved by Commissioner Johnson, seconded by uh, Commissioner Sumners for the approval of uh, PL180082 with the additional stipulation of screening on the garage. All those in favor? Opposed, and that passes 6 1 with um, Commissioner Brown in the dissent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our next case is Millennium at Rio Salado. <clears throat> Millennium at Rio Salado is proposing um, to amend the zoning map from GID to MU4 with a planned area development and development plan review. They're also asking for a use permit for tandem parking for the apartment portion of the development. The site is a very narrow uh, site oriented north to south on the north side of Rio Salado Parkway. It's surrounded by industrial um, you may be familiar with the properties to the west of it, which is the Rio 2100 project. We've seen several um, projects come in there. The two hotels that you see are already built, and this office building and streetlights residential is up here, and we've got Freedom Financial 1 and 2 here. Um, and then there's Brock is an existing development over here, so the site is long and narrow. They are proposing... Um, development standards within the PAD, um, generally in conformance with the surrounding areas in terms of the setbacks and the heights. Uh, they are splitting the property into two new lots, so there would be commercial along the street front and the residential would be to the north. Site plan, this is the overall site plan showing the commercial up here at Rio Salado, and then this back portion here is the residential component. a little bit closer, although it's such a large site, it's hard to see. These are just a few of the elevations. I'll defer to the applicant to go through the details of the design. They did come to you in a study session to talk about the materials. One of the things that came out during the process in this is a requirement for an additional 14-foot easement along Rio Salado Parkway for the future streetcar. In order to accommodate that, they had to shift their landscaping so we could preserve as many of the trees along the street frontage. And they're working on making some additional modifications to the site plan to get an additional six feet along Rio Salado Parkway to assure that we have a landscape area along the street front after the streetcar project goes in, which we don't have a design for yet. Um, I bring this up because it's going to be an impact on some of the other projects like 2100 and future projects as we require more right-of-way for um, the infrastructure for streetcar in the future. Um, 
but the applicant was uh, willing to work with us on all of the conditions of approval. I've not received any calls of inquiry or concern for the project, so we're recommending approval of the project with the stipulations. Um, there will also be a public access easement that runs the full length of the private drive to connect back to the Freedom Financial, which will wrap around to the lighted, lighted intersection within 2100. There's some renderings. This is the commercial development at the street front. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions of staff? Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does the uh, this property owner also own the property to the north? That's no. That's a whole separate. Is that development? That's part of the 2100 development. That'll be part of the 2100. Yes. And when they come in, they will be required to provide a public easement through the property to make the connection. Okay. Thanks. Other questions, uh, Vice Chair Lyon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the same foolish question as last time about the parking. Um, I see that the requirement is 689, and they're saying we have 655, including tandem, and sounds like we're saying we're okay with that. Um, and we do look at each site in the context of, of where it is, and in this situation where you've got the commercial and the residential, um, you know, we're talking about a delta of about 30 spaces. Um, they are providing some parking along the street that can serve the private drive. Um, The right section okay right here are some on-street parallel spaces that can serve guests of the apartment community as well as people going to the restaurant but we figure there is going to be an internal capture with the residents and the commercial uses either from their guests or from employees working there and and living there so that is a we consider a relatively small delta for the size of the site and what they're requesting and had no issues with their parking Fair enough. Other questions of staff? <coughs> Seeing none, the applicant do the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. For your records, Wendy Riddell with the law firm Barry Riddell, 6750 East Camelback. My pleasure to be here this evening on behalf of Mira Vista and uh, Brad Wild. <coughs> Madam Chair, thank you for all your years of service, by the way. It's also my honor to be here on your final night. Um, I'm going to kind of give a quick brief overview and then focus on the discussion I heard at um, study session tonight, knowing you have seen this once before, but certainly if there are any other questions, uh, I'm happy to address those as well. So I think as, uh, as Diana mentioned, you can see here, there we go, uh, this kind of gives you a better indication of how the site works together. So this being the site that's under consideration here. But um, we've now gone ahead and kind of plugged in what you've seen for Rio 2100. And really, this is kind of the final phase of the Tempe Marketplace plan that started out with retail, um, a lot of employment that has followed, and now coming in with an additional um, residential components, really for that live, work, play idea. Uh, technical difficulties. Here we go. Um, existing conditions, I'm sure you all are very familiar, and the site has been used for a long time to store vehicles. It's a little bit of an eyesore, um, particularly, I think, for the Rio 2100 project and the success of that project and the type of employers um, that we're looking to draw to Tempe in such a, um, a neat area, the confluence of both freeways. So, of course, our request here today uh, is to rezone for mixed use to allow 260-unit four-story apartments. A modern food court style uh, restaurant, it's really a food hall concept uh, that's intended to benefit not only the multifamily that we're proposing here today, but all of the employers um, and the employees that you see coming to the area, use permit for the tandem parking and development plan review. So one of the things that makes this particular site so attractive to us is that we know this will be the site of a future streetcar that comes through. Diana mentioned um, the 14 feet that we'll be dedicating for that future streetcar. Um, and that, that alignment will come right in front of this site. So we think that makes it particularly appropriate um, what we're proposing here today. Uh, the site, the general plan, is planned already for mixed use, precisely what we're proposing. 
It also anticipates high density up to 65 dwelling units per acre. So essentially everything that we're here proposing today is part of the City of Tempe's vision for this site. This is also part of the 101-202 interchange growth area where their goal is to remove blighted conditions and reclaim that area for reuse, redevelopment with mixed use and regional business. Again, finishing out the Tempe Marketplace plan exactly as um, suggested. And as part of this interchange hub as well, uh, which encourages high pedestrian activity, resident focused services, hence the pedestrian connection through the site up to Rio 2100 uh, and even further north. Uh, frontage improvement along Rio Salado is essential to redeveloping the area. And multimodal transportation center, ideal for mixed use commercial. Again, precisely what we're here proposing. Another question came up previously, what would that food hall concept look like? This gives you an idea of the streetscape, the draw, kind of that hub for everybody here in the area. And then to get to the question I heard at the study session. So we did engage CivTech to do a traffic study for this site, and I'm going to do my best impression of a traffic engineer here tonight, which I will admit is a little bit dangerous. Um, but when CivTech looked at this site, they recognized that it was appropriate to do a shared parking model really for two reasons. One, because of the fact that you've got two really kind of disparate uses and the times when people are actively trying to come to the food hall, for example, over the lunch hour, is not the time that you'll see um, the apartment complexes. I know this, um, this commission is very sophisticated. They understand how that works. Um, and you're able to achieve ultimately even you know, an internal capture between those two uses. So when we looked at the breakdown, and I should say that doesn't even take into account. So when they did the traffic study, they did not even include in there the fact that you're ultimately going to have streetcar here or that you have you know, orbits and bus service to the area. So when you look through the, the traffic study, it has 499 spaces. That's what the residential requires. Guests and commercial, that leaves a total of 169 spaces to be used between those two. And then there's a 5% kind of buffer that they give for efficiency in circulation. So when you do that, the net is a requirement of 663 spaces, and we're actually providing in excess of that with the 668. So we are very comfortable uh, that the parking that we're proposing here is sufficient. Staff has reviewed the report. I think it's safe to say they're comfortable as well. Um, and certainly the economics, we know that we better do a good job, that people aren't going to want to rent. They aren't going to want to come eat lunch someplace they can't park. So again, we're very comfortable with that. Um, there was also a question I know about the tandem spaces. So we have roughly 35 percent, 96 units that um, do have this tandem type space. You'll note that stipulation number two of our use permit has a requirement that those spaces are actually leased to the same unit. So under all circumstances, if a tenant is coming and deciding that they're going to rent this space, they know precisely what they're getting. They know that those are their two assigned spaces. And we actually think it provides a little bit of a unique opportunity in the marketplace because they can have a secured garage. So you have a rental unit, the ability to have a secured garage, and then a tandem space behind them. Um, I know there was a little discussion about the overhang as well. I will tell you, and I made the architect kind of go through it with me, certainly here if you want to ask him. I think the, the graphic is a little bit deceptive because you have to keep in mind, so there's plenty of room for the first space. There is a car. It, it's um, nearly entirely screened. And then there's also a balcony component above. So there will be a, a couple of feet that will um, protrude, but the vast majority of the car is comfortable, uh, is, I should say, concealed. So we're very comfortable that that is a plan that will work. We think it's a little bit unique. It provides an opportunity in the marketplace to have that type of secured garage. Um, that being said, we think this is a great project to, fin to finish out the Tempe Marketplace plan. And uh, we hope and respectfully request your support. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions for the applicant? Uh, Vice Chair Lyon. Um, Ms. Fridell, um, thank you for your presentation. I, I relinquish my um, squabbling about parking. Um, I just have one sort of curious question. 
Um, if you've got your second tandem parking space with cars mostly under the building, um, I, this is more of a sort of observation question for the architect. Um, I guess I'm just hopeful that you're going to think about how the drip edges above all those cars work because um, you'd hate to have runoff running straight onto all those cars uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> um, other questions uh, for the applicant? Uh, Commissioner Brown. Let's bring it on home. Um, I don't see any sections here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I turned the page and there they are. So you have parapets in your screen, your AC units, and your uh, bedrooms are 10 and 12 feet wide, and you have a nice courtyard that's about as wide as it is tall enough. So, no more questions. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, if not, it is a public hearing, so I'll do the call to the audience. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on this? I don't see anyone, so we'll close the public hearing. Do you want any closing remarks? No, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, comments? Any comments? If there are no comments, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve Millennium at Rio Salado, PL180051. Is there a second? been moved by Commissioner Amorosi, seconded by Vice Chair Lyon for the approval. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that passes 7-0. Um, next on our agenda, we have uh, Commission announcement and City staff announcements. I don't, staff, are there any announcements? No, Madam Chair, thank you for your service, and it was great working with you, so thank no you. Worries. Commissioners, anything? Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also want to publicly thank you for your leadership here on the DRC and your mentoring of me as a new person, and I'm hoping I can still call you for advice after, <laughs> after you leave, uh, because I value your input. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your service to the community. I was on this commission when you uh, started your first term and, uh, and went off for a while, and, and uh, now I'm back on while you're still here. So <laughs> I just want you to know that after you decompress for a while and you start to miss having your Tuesday nights tied up, that it is possible to uh, to come back so and, and I would welcome that you've always been very uh, you've taken this uh, volunteer position very seriously uh, you study the projects you've got strong uh, feelings about what's right for our community and it goes all the way back to when you were on the City Council but uh, I've always appreciated the uh, the work that you do for Tempe and thank you With that, <laughs> we're adjourned, and I want to thank everyone. It's been great serving with you. So. Commissioner Brown's got his finger <laughs> oh. <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone.